Today, I want to talk to you about my passion. My passion is oral facial myofunctional therapy. I want you to walk away from today's webinar with a few things. One, I want you to learn about what oral facial myofunctional disorders look like. I want you to realize that so, so many of your current patients on your caseload actually are presenting with a myofunctional disorder. Um, it's not just a straight up arctic thing. It's not a straight up feeding and chewing issue that actually is part of a bigger picture um, called OMDs. So that's number one. Then I want you to feel like you're walking out of today's webinar understanding what orofacial myofunctional therapy is. Um, I'm going to share the two specific programs, the three specific programs that I use in my practice. Um, but I also want you to realize that myofunctional therapy has really been out there for years, guys. And you might have been pulling pieces of it, but maybe not using it in total. So um, I, I want you to feel comfortable being able to identify and know what myofunctional therapy is and, and how to use it with your clients. And then lastly, I want to take some time to share with you how I took my knowledge base, which is always growing and always um, improving, um, about my personal disorders and that programs that I use. And I've created a private practice solely focusing on it. And I'm making more money now and having more success than I did in the you know 15 years prior, um, loving what I did um, and, and working with stroke and brain injury clients. So those are my three goals. For, for you today in today's webinar. So let's get into it. Um, I'm so appreciative that you're here. I have, Julie, can they see the PowerPoint right now already? Or do I have to click a button? I told you there was gonna be a technical issue. Um, so we've got this PowerPoint lined up with Julie actually uploaded for you guys. So you can see it listed under handouts. So you can follow along with us or you can reflect and look back later if you have questions and wanna look back at what we talked about. Let me just check one thing. Okay. So Julie is accessing the um, PowerPoint. And I think she's going to double check it, but I think you guys should be able to see me um, in the corner of your screen. And then you should be able to see the um, PowerPoint as well. Oh, <laughs> but we might have just lost. That's okay, no worries, we have plenty of time. And I promise I will get through everything and I will answer any questions that you have. Um, okay, so there you go. So I think I'm at the bottom of the screen though, I can't see myself, which is probably better for me. Um, and you guys can see the PowerPoint that we have um, in front of you. So I've, I've titled it an SLP's approach to orofacial myofunctional therapy. Um, because I really, there are lots of practitioners out there that provide myofunctional therapy, but I only train, talk to, and work with speech therapists because we really have the advantage of being able to treat holistically what the myofunctional needs are because we can do speech, we can do swallowing, and we can do facial and oral musculature. So that's why um, it's listed as an SLP's approach to myofunctional therapy. The little girl on this cover, I call her my poster child. And I have permission from um, Alina's mom to use her name, to use her pictures, and to talk about her. Um, because she is a perfect example of what an OMD looks like. I ran into them at the mall. And um, this little girl had a big open bite. And I said to mom, oh, I had no idea that Alina was a thumb sucker. In my mind, I'm thinking, cha-ching, cha-ching, there's going to be a $400 client for me to help this child stop sucking her thumb. And she said, oh, she's not a thumb sucker. And upon further investigation and case history and looking at Alina's presentation, we realized that many different signs and symptoms that she was having were all actually interrelated and really can qualify what the definition of an OMD is. She was tongue tied. She had severe allergies. She was a mouth breather. She had feeding and chewing issues. She would choke on food and um, vomit it up. And she'd been doing that since she was a young child. She had a speech sound error that we corrected. She had a tongue thrust swallow pattern. Um, so all of these little individual things that mom had noted through the years, we were able to put together in a big picture and then treat them 
um, in an interdisciplinary team and and her smile and her swallow and her speech and her facial resting posture they're all now all perfect so she's she's my little poster child and um, she's the best I'm, I'm always so appreciative to them for letting me share their story and we have many many more of those today while we talk through the webinar uh, just a quick about myself I don't want to talk too much about myself other than that I I'm a Badger. I will always be a Badger. I went to the University of Wisconsin and graduated in 1995. I co um, dual major in communication disorders and education. I then came back home because I'm from the Maryland area and went to grad school at GW and um, graduated in 97. For the first 15 years of my practice, I worked in neurological settings. So I probably worked in every acute care, inpatient rehab, outpatient, um, and home settings that you can imagine here in the Maryland, D.C. area. Um, and I became a part of creating a program called Reading for Life. Those were aphasia book clubs. Spoke on it at ASHA a bunch of years ago. Um, and then had my big segue into this field of myofunctional therapy uh, after a random encounter at my orthodontist office. I was sitting in the chair with braces on as an adult and Dr. Peter Sheehan of Sheehan Orthodontics in, in Germantown was my orthodontist and now I feel very comfortable calling him my friend. Um, he travels around with me to some of my seminars um, now that he's learned more about myofunctional therapy. But at the time, I was sitting next to a child who had braces on and had a horrible tongue thrust. And I said to Dr. Sheehan, well, goodness, what do, you, what do you do with that boy? He's got his braces on, but how do you correct his tongue thrust? And he said, I send them to their school speech therapist. And I said, well, Gosh, I've never been a school speech therapist, but I know one thing, and that is that it's very hard for them to get um, on the caseload if they just have a tongue thrust because there would be no academic need for them to receive intervention in the schools on that 80-person caseload. So he said, well, gosh, if you know what you're doing, I'll send them to you. So I went out and got some education, and within no time I realized that myofunctional therapy and myofunctional disorders was my new niche market and I became obsessed. I've had extensive training in the field um, and now I currently teach seminars like, around the country helping speech therapists learn what's been in front of them all these years and help them work with patients that they are already treating but in a more holistic, more fundamental, um, more underlying muscular fashion than maybe they had been before. So um, that's me. So let's get to the, the meat of it, everybody. Let's talk about what an orofacial myofunctional disorder is. Um, this definition has kind of changed and morphed through the years, um, but I really like this one. There were a group of speech pathologists who were working with ASHA because ASHA's previous definition of an OMD really was an OMD is another name for a tongue thrust. And that's not really correct. A tongue thrust is one symptom of an OMD, but it is not the definition of it. And I really liked um, that this group of speech pathologists got together and created another definition that they used in a letter that they wrote to ASHA trying to get some corrections in the de definitions. And, and so I'm, I'm borrowing from them and I think they'd be happy that I'm spreading the word and sharing um, what they've developed. But basically, an OMD is any change from normal. So this might involve your oral or oral facial musculature. Also includes the dental or skeletal structure. So that's craniofacial development that interferes with normal growth and development or the functioning abilities of the dentofacial structures or anything that calls attention to itself. And I think that that's a really important point at the end, anything that calls attention to itself. So when we look at the picture of this little boy up above, there are many things that call attention to itself in this picture. We can see, I mean, you guys feel free to type them in and, and share them with Julie. Can you ask if people's audio is working? Guys, can I can it look to me it looks like my microphone is working, but is the audio working? Can you guys type into Julie and let her know? Is the audio working? It's okay. Okay, good. We're just double checking. Wouldn't want you to miss any of this content. So what calls attention to itself when you look at this picture of this little boy? 
I'm just gonna th throw some things out there that you might already have recognized. And that is number one, first and foremost, is that open mouth resting posture, the low tone of his lips, the forward hanging posture of his tongue, the sunken eyes that he's been, that he looks a little bit tired. Um, I'm gonna bet that this kid's got allergies. Maybe he's got enlarged tonsils or adenoids, for sure a mouth breather. And um, I'm gonna bet that he's a tongue thrust swallow as well. So when we look at this boy, we know that this is not how a healthy, appropriate facial resting posture should be, right? I'm hoping that while you're all listening to me at home, or your office or wherever you might be, that you are sitting there with your lips closed, breathing through your nose with your tongue resting on the roof of your mouth. And that is going to not only help you with appropriate breathing, but with all the oral facial musculature that's, that is needed for appropriate growth and development for young children. So um, over time, the effect of these error patterns leaves a mark on the face and the growth and the development of your skull. So that is what we are defining an OMD as, and I like it, and I hope you guys do too. Julie, is it possible for me to move this control panel out of the way? Can I just click on it and slide it? Okay, so I don't need to see that, great. Um, so what are some causes of OMDs? I think the comment at the bottom is the most pertinent to me. And that is that it's usually not one single cause that's identified, but it really multifactorial. That there could be a lot of contributing factors that's the cause of an OMD. I think of Alina as my example of that. She had many different causes, not just one issue. But some reasons and causes um, for myofunctional disorders might include airway obstruction. So this might be enlarged adenoids or tonsils, maybe um, something in the nasal septum like turbinates that, that are, are congested or clogged or obstructed, um, sinus infections, increased pressures. That's what I said, enlarged nasal. See, I was talking before I was reading. Enlarged nasal turbinates, a deviated septum. Um, those obstructions might cause somebody to then breathe through their mouth. Allergies, asthma, pollutants, again, all related to airway and airway patency. We then get into your oral pharyngeal muscle tone. So having low muscle tone resulting in airway collapse. With regard to that, we're talking about upper airway with um, URs or obstructive sleep apnea or snoring, sleep disordered breathing. So that low oral pharyngeal muscle tone has been connected to this sleep disordered breathing spectrum, as I like to call it, or actually as Nicole Archambault likes to call it. Um, a low lingual and labial muscle tone really results in improper position of the tongue. Thinking back to that little boy that you were just looking at the picture of. And then a big one, that you're gonna hear people talking about more and more is restricted oral frenula. Um, also known as tied oral tethers or TOTs. I think that we've done as speech therapists a disservice to ourselves in that there were previous articles and research that seemed to indicate that tied oral tethers, um, meaning short lingual or labial frenulum did not have a lasting effect didn't have an effect on breastfeeding, didn't have a, an effect on speech or chewing or feeding, and that is just wrong. There is more research now that's coming out on a regular basis that shows the opposite, that restricted oral frenula actually can have a lasting effect, a detrimental effect, not only on your chewing, on your swallowing, on your speech, but also on your facial growth and presentation. And, um, I'm hoping, I, I work with an oral surgeon, Dr. James Ryan, here in Germantown, and he has written some incredible articles. His most recent article is actually trying to get in the hospitals infants to have screenings. So you know how they do screenings for auditory skills and making sure that they have adequate hearing in the hospital when a baby is born? Hopefully what's going to be added is an observation to see if they have restricted frenulum. And maybe that would, A, help these children with successful breastfeeding for those that have unsuccessful breastfeeding, but maybe more than that, it can prevent some of these longer term issues that we're seeing over time. So you're gonna hear more and more about um, tied oral tethers. Sucking and chewing habits, 
um, are, is another cause of OMDs. If we do not use it, we will lose it. That's a line that I say all the time. And if you do not practice using your muscles of mastication, it's why God has given them to us, then you will lose that muscle function. I, I always think like when I go exercise, if I am don't hold my plank and I don't do my core muscle strength, then I will lose that muscle strength. And it is no different with our oral facial musculature. It is exactly the same. Um, chewing and eating behaviors in association with that, um, lots of children with food aversions and avoidances, but really it's because they haven't used that musculature. And so what do they do? They go to processed, soft processed um, foods and everybody's eating a go-gurt, everybody's eating a squeezable applesauce. And we're not giving our children because we're so fearful of choking or just for ease of care and just, trust me, I have four kids. Sometimes life just needs to be easy. Um, but we are doing them a disservice because we're not helping them build up the musculature that they need to support healthy eating habits um, for a good dental diet, for good um, facial growth and development. So, you know, we think about cavemen back in the day, they had like jaws of steel and they could eat like a lamb shank um, and hold it in their hand. Our children today, they can't do that. They really, they want all chicken nuggets, mac and cheese, and apple sauces. And, and it's our fault because we're, that's what we're doing. We're not helping them build up that muscle strength. So again, these causes can be multifactorial. Um, let me see. There we go. So we've talked about the causes of the OMDs. What's the consequence? So what happens if these if these OMDs go untreated? Well, some very obvious things that we see happen, and I see them happen every day in my practice, is orthodontic relapse. So again, I love working with orthodontists because we're their insurance policy. So everybody's spending $8,000 in orthodontia for their children. They don't mind spending another $1,500 or $1,000 or whatever your price point is to help ensure that that patient or their child is not going to have orthodontic relapse. Do you know how mad parents are when six months or three months, or I've even had kids two weeks after getting their braces off, have their bite open back up? It is not a pretty sight and the parents are pissed and they are blaming the orthodontist for not catching a myofunctional issue that could have been treated while they were in braces. Um, so I see this relapse issue all the time. Breathing disorders are another consequence of OMDs. So we talk about this spectrum. Nicole Archambault is a speech pathologist. Oh, her practice is, it's not mind over matter. I'll have to look that up, Julie, if you can look that up. I want to share it. She just, I don't have the article in front of me because I'm not in my office today. And if I did, I would have like 500 things at my fingertips, but I am in my home office. <laughs> And um, so I don't have everything at my fingertips, but she wrote a, probably a few months ago in the ASHA Leader an article about sleep disordered breathing and this continuum that what starts out as mouth breathing then turns into sleep disordered breathing, obstructive sleep apnea, and possibly upper airway respiratory syndrome. Um, we don't want our, our people living on CPAP machines for the rest of their lives, all because their muscle strength is low and it's um, we should be building it up from a, t from a younger, early intervention age. Other consequences would be poor dental health or periodontal disease. If your tongue is always resting on the bottom of your mouth or in the wrong position and pushing, pushing, pushing against those teeth, that can cause periodontal disease and breakdown of the gums, as can mouth breathing. Um, Malocclusion is, a, is an obvious consequence of an untreated OMD. And Alina, my little poster girl, is the perfect example of that because she had an open bite. And in my mind, I was assuming it was because of an oral habit like thumb sucking, but it wasn't. It was because she was tongue tied and her tongue was resting in between her teeth all the time. And that pressure of that muscle against the bone and against those teeth opened it up. Um, in the upper right hand corner of your screen, you can see a quote that, um, people in the myofunctional world use all the time because it's just the truth. And it's that muscle trumps bone, but airway trumps everything. So I want you to think about it like this little, the tongue is an organ comprised of many muscles, but those muscles will always push whatever they can out of the way. So an orthodontist or a dentist might align the teeth and make them look beautiful and perfect. But if the very small but very strong, mighty muscle behind it is pushing erroneously or incorrectly, it will push the bone out of the way. It will open the bite back up. 
So um, I have a question from yes. Chris. Chris says, when do you recommend a tongue tie release on an individual? As early as possible, Chris, as early as possible. So if somebody is identified in infancy or toddlerhood, you should Think about it, in infancy, if you're able to get that tongue tie release done and they are breastfeeding, the breastfeeding in and of itself is the lingual stretch and the assistance to make sure that that tongue does not re-adhere or that fiber does not grow back. In children, adolescents and adults, when I send them for their tongue tie release, I am seeing them three sessions prior to their procedure. I'm doing lingual stretches to teach their muscle memory so that when the either laser or scalpel treatment is done, I can go right in back in there as soon as possible, continuing with those lingual stretches and that muscle memory kicks in and we can get the biggest range of motion possible. Different doctors approach that procedure in different ways. You want to make sure that you have the right practitioners on your team. And it's very important. And I talk about this all the time that I used to, um, I, my, my nephew's a perfect example. When I first started getting trained in OMT, I recognized that he was tongue tied and he had an open bite laterally on one side. He'd been in braces for two and a half years wearing rubber bands, but his tongue was so strong and tied that it would just sit in the, um, in the side of his mouth and open up his bite. I sent him, I used to, um, work on the craniofacial team over at Children's Hospital um, during one of my uh, internships. And I was like, oh my God, I'm gonna send you to my doctor that I know over at Children's, this is gonna be perfect. And I sent him in there and I came for the appointment and the doctor said, protrude your tongue, stick your tongue out. And because he was able to protrude it one or two inches past his lips, they said he was fine. He was not fine. His tongue was in a heart-shaped posture and he couldn't lift his tongue up even the slightest bit within his mouth. If they had just had him bring his tongue in and go like this, they would have seen that his tongue got tied before he even got to his lower incisors. And if they had looked at the bigger picture, which was that he had been in braces for two and a half years with an open bite, they would have recommended something different. I now know better, so I do better. And I send my patients to specific doctors, ENTs and oral surgeons that I know trust my measurements, trust my um, observations, trust my reports, and know that if I'm sending them somebody for a phrenectomy, for ankyloglossia, for a tongue tie release, all these are synonymous terms, um, that it's because I believe that there's some kind of functional impact on, on this child or this adult. Um, so great question, Chris. The answer to your question is as soon as possible. Why wait? to intervene on something that's gonna ultimately have some kind of detrimental effect in some way, shape or form. Okay, and Alina was a perfect example. Had trouble breastfeeding when she was younger. Open bite when I saw her at age eight or nine years old. But all the other things had already come into play. Speech, choking on food, open bite, allergies, sinus issues. To, um, yes. Chris has a follow-up question yes. saying, just three sessions before a release question. So yes, what I like to do is I like, I have a really good relationship with my oral surgeons that I send my patients to. So I see them for three sessions. I have a list of exercises that I do for lingual stretches just to get that motor memory. I know the child or the adult is already restricted. They then go in the, for the procedure and depending on how the surgeon does it, meaning that some depending on who I send to. Sometimes they only need laser procedure release done. I can go back in the next day and start again. Um, they have more. And so it says, yes. don't we need to look at more before they're released and then on a 12 year old? Look at more what? Um, so the whole question was just three sessions before release question mark, not to treat more to get tongue elevation question. Don't we need to look at more before they're released on a 12 year old? On a 12 year old, my question is, what is the functional impact for this child? Is this a kid who has been in speech therapy since kindergarten, all trying to achieve speech sound carryover with no result? Why are they not getting a result? They are not getting a result because they are tongue tied. And I see kids all day long that have been in speech therapy for years and years. And, and the parents are like, why are they not making any progress? Why is there no carryover? Why is this person not being discharged from therapy? And you have to look at the underlying, the underlying issue 
of why. And I believe in many, many of our patients, we're not looking at the underlying muscular issues. In this case, possibly in the 12 year olds you're talking about, it's because that frenulum is too short. They might be able to achieve sound in isolation, but not in conversational speech where we really have that fast acting movement of the tongue. Does that answer your question? I hope I'm going in the direction of what you're inquiring about. Of course, we're doing a full evaluation on our children. We're not having somebody come in our office, see that they're tongue tied and be like, go for a vernectomy, you're done. We are looking at their big picture and I have an orofacial myofunctional evaluation that I am looking at every orofacial resting and moving posture of the tongue, of the palate, of the teeth, of the jaw, of their chewing and feeding, of their swallowing, of their speech, of their respiration, and um, before I just send them for the procedure, I'm looking at the holistic picture of the child. Um, more questions? One more question sure. from Patricia. And she says, does a tongue tie typically affect our acquisition? Yes, yes, and yes. I love your question, Patricia, because I, my, my best story is I had been working with a client who was a long-term thumb sucker. We eliminated the oral habit and she had a neutral R. And um, she'd been getting speech therapy. She was in second grade. She'd been getting it since she was um, in first grade. Even though that was early for them to start, they were working on other speech issues and they were talking about the R in therapy. It was not their only reason for picking her up. She had other issues. Um, but when I went in, mom and dad wanted me to go in to talk to the speech therapist about her eliminating the oral habit and with the vocalic R program that I had been using with this little girl. It was amazing, she was totally stimulable. Um, the therapist realized that the long-term oral habit had caused this neutral R and trained the tongue to be down and forward in the mouth. This child was not tongue-tied. But in the session, I said to the school speech therapist, hey, now that I'm showing you this R program that I use, do you have anybody else at school that you could get permission from the parent that you want me to just take a peek at? She pulls down a fourth grader who has been in speech therapy since he was an infant and toddlers when he was a baby for many different reasons, articulation, et cetera, et cetera. I can't even list for you all the things on his symptom list. And she's like, oh, can you take a peek at this guy? Because he's been in speech therapy forever and I just can't get him to carry over the sound. The boy takes one sit in the chair. He sits down in the chair. He looks at me. He starts to talk. I can see that he is tongue tied from having a conversation with him and I have him lift up his tongue, he can't elevate his tongue because he's so severely tongue-tied. Well, I pointed out to the school speech therapist who's appalled because she's like, I can't believe I've missed this. Like, I never looked under his tongue because in school, I think it's a little bit hard to put your hands on, not whatever. She's a great speech therapist. She just happened to not have looked under his tongue. And um, he was severely tied. Unfortunately, I, was it wasn't a client that I had on my caseload. So she contacted the parents. They went for a clipping. They went to the wrong practitioner who took a tiny little scalpel and cut laterally midline along the frenum. No blood, no stitches, no laser, no nothing, no change. So ironically, I had known this child. I contacted the parents to see how he was doing told them that it was me that had been in school and um, resent him for a revision from an oral surgeon that I liked. At the time we realized that, he, that this little boy had so many symptoms of an OMD. He had an open bite, he was a snorer, he had a high vaulted palate, he was a tongue thruster, he was tongue tied, he had severe allergies, he could not breathe, through his nose because he had only breathed through his mouth and he was a thumb sucker in fourth grade. So again, another poster child, I'm not gonna show you his picture or his face or anything per the parent's request, but this kid just got his braces off. Actually yesterday, they just texted me, I forgot. They texted me yesterday that he got his braces off. He's amazing. He had a successful tongue tie revision and, and clipping. His R is remediated within three months, guys within three months. Um, he now rests his tongue on the roof of his mouth. His bite, he had palatal expansion with front four braces from Dr. Sheehan. Um, we're trying to get him to go back to the ENT because I really want to start working on his nasal breathing. We stopped his thumb sucking in a day. 
Um, he's amazing. He still likes to wear sock a bit, but whatever works for you, right? So to answer your question, it was Patricia, right? To answer your question, neutral R, long-term R problems look under the tongue, guys. You could be missing something so, so obvious um, and so easy to fix. Um, you know, people get scared of a medical procedure um, that, you know, but the, the mortality rate with somebody getting a phrenectomy, I don't even know what that number would be. And if it is a number that it's maybe related to some other medical issue that that child had going on or adult had going on. So great question, everybody, both Chris and Patricia, thank you so much. Um, okay, so again, my passion, I could talk about this all day, but this idea of muscle trumping bone and airway trumps everything is that yes, the muscle will push the teeth and anything out of the way, but if you can't breathe, you will do whatever you need to do to breathe. So if you can't breathe, if you've spent your whole time thumb sucking and pushing up and impinging into your nasal airway such that your airways are so small in your nasal cavities um, or inflamed for whatever reason, you will open your mouth and you will be a mouth breather because we have to breathe first and we'll do whatever we need to do to breathe. Um, other consequences are jaw joint problems, facial pain. If I am always, um, if I am always misusing my mandibular joints in order to swallow, in order to jump my jaw forward or push my tongue forward, some kind of error pattern, I will eventually cause some pain in those joints and in my face. Um, if I, um, I'm jumping down to the last one. If I constantly have to purse my lips and overuse my mentalis muscle to make sure that my lips are closed so that the food and liquid doesn't come flying out, I will cause changes to the structure of my face. I will create a grimace. You know, I always joke like I'm a super expressive person and I smile a lot and I raise my eyebrows a lot and I have these lovely little lines <laughs> to show it, um, to, to show for it because um, what we do leaves a mark. Faces that we make, they leave a mark. Um, for better or for worse. And the same goes for swallowing. Um, other consequences, uh, let me see what I haven't hit. Biting, chewing, swallowing abnormalities. You know, um, oh gosh, I really have to get moving. We're okay, okay. Um, there's evidence to show that if you, like I said, don't use it, you lose it, those muscles become weak and we don't have the chewing support, like the, the support musculature to make chewing um, supported correct and adequate. If we're always using our tongue to thrust forward in, it in order to propel our food and liquid back, um, we will, it's an oral phase dysphagia. I mean, I really, that's, that's the bottom line. We are swallowing experts as speech pathologists, and I truly believe in my core and in my gut that a tongue thrust swallow is another name for an oral phase dysphagia because it's not proper. It's not correct. Excessive grinding of the teeth can wear them down. Why is somebody grinding their teeth? Do they have improper posture of their tongue? Are they doing it in an effort to get their airway open because they're not breathing properly? Um, we need to look at these things. And of course, because we're speech pathologists, we are the ones that are listening to how people talk. We're always taking notice. I, I joke with Julie all the time that I've ruined her and I've ruined my kids because they can literally speak to somebody and then they'll turn to me and be like, that person had a lisp, right? Or that person that can't say their R's, right? Um, that person has a tongue thrust, right? So yes, I, I, I kind of ruin people. But yeah, the consequence of not treating these OMDs is a lifelong misarticulation. When you have these kids that are sitting in your clinic, sitting in your school, sitting in your office, and they've been in therapy for five years, and they're not getting that carryover, they're not succeeding, you have to think about why. You have to think about why. I just had a little girl who's 13 years old. She's been in speech therapy since she was an infant. She has a lateralized F. And nobody's ever done any bit of lingual exercises with her. No, but her tongue is incredibly weak. And then yet it's hyper tight when it goes midline into the point. So nobody has ever taught her how to strengthen her lingual musculature to support a proper palatal sound. Um, so we gotta look at the underlying issues. Okay, good.
to making sure I'm going in order. So there are tons of articles out there to support the research to support myofunctional therapy. And I'm so grateful. There's an incredible speech pathologist out there. I've taken some of her advanced training courses, Linda D'Onofrio, and she has made a lot of those articles accessible to us. And then as us as practitioners, we then share them with um, people in the Simon Says practice um, inner circle and, and, and so forth. And one of these articles that I think is so, so, so pertinent, um, I take it into every orthodontist office that I go do a lunch and learn at, is the one that was published in 2010 by Smith Peter et al. What they did was they took two groups of individuals that they all knew had a tongue thrust. The experimental group was lucky enough because they got myofunctional therapy in conjunction with orthodontic appliances and treatment. And then the control group, poor guys, they just got orthodontic treatment, but they did not get any myofunctional intervention. And then they looked at their relapse within six months of those programs and wowzers, look at the difference. The experimental group that got the myofunctional therapy only had a 0.5 millimeter relapse. And I have to say, guys, I've, I've now been working with a lot of orthodontists for a number of years. That 0.5 millimeters, that's almost just normal. I, I, I can't imagine that that's so far off from normal. Um, and that 3.4 millimeter relapse for those that had a tongue thrust or a myofunctional issue and did not get their treatment is tremendous. I mean, 3.4 millimeters um, is a huge open bite, guys. Huge open bite. So I love this article. And your orthodontist will know this article, especially if they have any understanding of myofunctional therapy. They've seen this before. Again, another article that um, had recently came out that was looking at that sleep disordered breathing continuum that I was talking that Nicole Archambault brought our awareness to. There's current literature that talks about myofunctional therapy having an impact and helping with um, those with sleep disordered breathing. And in the study that they did, they, they found that um, myofunctional therapy can decrease your apnea hypopnea index, that's the amount of times that you stop breathing during the evening, during the sleeping cycle. Um, it increases oxygen saturation. It impacts your snoring and your sleepiness outcomes on like rating scales. Um, that essentially myofunctional therapy can serve as an adjunct to other OSA treatments. And those other OSA treatments are usually CPAP machines. Um, and in these studies, this one by Camacho et al., he found that there was a 50% reduction in those AHI events in adults that used OMT and 62% reduction for those with kids um, with, um, that used myofunctional therapy because, guys, our kids shouldn't be snoring. Our kids should not be having sleep disordered breathing. Our kids should not be having obstructive sleep apnea. And if they are, we need to think about why. Um, I have a question slash explanation from Justine. Yes. And she said she is a school-based speech pathologist and has a fifth grade student that's had a tongue thrust exercise goal until third grade that was dismissed. Okay. Their paperwork is not clear why it was dismissed. And she also had an R sound. Yes. Also reached that goal. She has a frontal S. Her teeth do not touch at the rest mm -hmm. for her tongue is forward and her palate is extremely high and narrow. Mm -hmm. She hates dismissing her knowledge. Her, not, her knowing her speech is still greatly impacted in the school. She's at a loss at what else she can do without a team approach. Okay. Um, any suggestions from talk, besides talking to the parents? So I help? think, what was it, Justine? Justine. Yes. Okay, Justine, I think step one for you is you need to go look under that child's tongue. You need to see why that open bite is there. So there's a reason. So I say always the teeth are a roadmap to what our tongue or oral habits are. So you need to find out if that child is a thumb sucker, a passy user, a finger sucker, a nail biter. There's a reason why that bite is open. So it's either her tongue that's sitting in that space or it's her thumb or fingers that's sitting in that space and she might possibly be tongue tied. Um, has she looked under her tongue at all? Um, she didn't say. Okay, so that would be step one. Step two is, yes, you know, find out, you, you need to kind of do an assessment to find out, is this child a mouth breather? 
does that tongue sit in that resting spot? You can think about, I mean, I have my programs that I use, but you know, again, there are lots of tongue thrust and myofunctional programs that are out there. They're not all as complete, you know, I've spent nine years kind of perfecting mine as to what they are, but you know, whether it's, you know, the tongue thrust book or Swallow Write or Swallow Works or the Simon Says Tongue Tips programs, there are programs out there that can kind of help give you some guidance as to what to do with that patient. But to me, open bite, uh, lisp, neutral R, scream to me their tongue tie or or improper resting posture of the tongue. And I would strengthen her tongue if it's not tied. If it's tied, I would refer, talk to the parents to see whether she needs to have her released. I hope that answers your question. So many things to do for that patient, by the way. Don't let them off your caseload. Um, so back to this article, just this is another article that talks about sleep disordered breathing and really, I have to say for many years, it wasn't something that I utilized or looked at in my practice. And now it's just becoming, it, it, it is the, the standard of care. We have to look at these things because in those with real severe sleep disordered breathing and obstructive sleep apnea, we're finding a correlation between attention deficit and learning disabilities in these children that are just so overtired who can't get adequate sleep. I know when my kids were young, I've got four kids, when my kids were young and just last night, my 11 year old couldn't sleep and I know just from that lack of sleep just it just throws you for a loop think about a little baby with a maturing a kid with a maturing brain who can focus who can pay attention who can learn so we have to look at these continuums so now we've talked about what myofunctional disorders look like and some of you are now thinking about your clients and your practice and this is the goal of what I want you to do today when you know better you do better I want you to think about your clients and look at them differently just like Justine was now that we know what, how to recognize a myofunctional disorder, the next question becomes, well, what is myofunctional therapy? Well, I want you to think about it as a series of therapeutic techniques that repatterns and optimizes your oral and your facial functions. I, because I have all my years in neuro, brain injury, stroke rehabilitation, I love to think of it as a neurologic re-education. And the difference is that in the patients that I worked with for so many years, we were rehabilitating. In here, we're habilitating. We're literally just taking a musculature that's not been used properly. We're just teaching proper function and then training it and re-educating them into proper function of it. Um, I have... A question from Angie. Yes. It says, if you have a fourth grader that is a thumb sucker with no desire to quit thumb sucking and parents are okay with it too, with RS blends, is therapy warranted? So I do believe that oral habit um, elimination is like essential. I have lots of training tools. I believe that sometimes people don't want to stop their oral habits because they don't understand the detrimental effect. And if you can do some education with the parents and with the kids, um, I have a cartoon PowerPoint, uh, Powtoon that I show to kids. I have comic books um, that I've made. I have a, I have my call my oral habit Avengers. And I have this amazing cartoonist who's, she, she's in high school, it's crazy. She's so talented. And she makes my comic books for me to teach kids about what the long-term consequence is of not stopping their sucking habits. So for example, in this comic book, it's Tim and, and he's this great kid, but it talks about that thumb sucking can spread your teeth apart. It can make a thumbprint and change the roof of your mouth, which impinges on your breathing. And it can make the muscles in your tongue weak, hence why we can't correct these speech sound errors. So if you're gonna take an approach with the parents and with the kid, you say to them, do you want to be in speech therapy for the rest of your life? Because these speech sounds will not improve without eliminating the oral habit. And I really, what I love about my Thumbs Up program is that it empowers these children. So it teaches them how to stop something that they think is so very hard, but they know is good for them. Most kids don't think that thumb sucking has any consequence except for germs and spreading their teeth apart and oh, I'm gonna get braces. They have no idea that it is training their tongue to be in the wrong place in their mouth it causes mouth breathing. It causes a low um, tone of the lips. It causes a long face syndrome, encourages a tongue thrust swallow, and can lead to these long-term consequences for your health. So it's our job to educate them. And I would say that don't abandon, don't give up, educate, educate, educate. So the more that you can teach the child and the parents 
the better chance you stand of trying to get them to eliminate the oral habits. Um, and they just might not understand what the long-term consequence of it is. Okay, I hope that answers your question. I want you to take a minute just to look at this PowerPoint. I want you to look at the little boy. He's another poster child, and I love this family. Um, this little kid was in fourth grade. He had been in speech therapy for three years prior, working on a S production. They said that he had corrected it, but he was making his S production with his S on the bottom of his mouth. Guess what he was still doing? Spitting all over his friends. So in fourth grade, they brought him to me and they said, this little guy is a super messy eater, and we still don't think his S is sound very, his sibilant sounds sound very good. And he's embarrassed to sit with his friends at lunch because they're actually making fun of him now. Mom and dad, dad is French. They have sit down family dinner every night and they constantly be yelling at him, close your mouth, eat and eater. Why are you such a messy eater? And, and, and not understanding that he really literally couldn't help it, couldn't help it. So in the tongue tips program, um, I was able to hook them up with an orthodontist who um, realized that this guy needed to have palatal expansion and he had an initial phase of front four braces. Um, you know, when we've impinged on our um, palate such that we've made it vaulted and narrow and the teeth are crowded and don't have space to fit around, we have this amazing two phase intervention that these orthodontists do now where they actually are able to widen. I want palatal expansion. I mean, it makes for the most gorgeous smile and give our teeth. We used to extract teeth, we used to do headgear. OK, so um, it brings down the palate and widens it so that the teeth can fit around. We worked on his facial musculature. We worked on his lingual musculature. We worked on his swallowing, we worked on his speech. He remedied everything. Six months out of the program, uh, mom called and said, I just feel like we need a little recap. I feel like his speech is not always perfect. And I jumped back in and I created what I call a maintenance program just to make sure that every week he is at least thinking about how he's speaking how he's swallowing and how he's sitting at rest when he's like watching TV or playing Fortnite or whatever it is that boys now in seventh grade do. Mm. So I don't know if you can see it from this picture. I always like lean towards my computer when I say this, but if you look at the picture on the left, mom is an occupational therapist and she pointed out to me the asymmetry of his nasio label fold on the right versus on the left. If you can really take a peek at it, you can see that that left side was so much more strong, so much more even, so much more symmetrical. And then after the program, everything just looks like sheer perfection. He is adorable, aside from the fact of being successful at this program. Love this kid. So what does myofunctional therapy include? Well, like we were talking about with Victoria before, um, it's eliminating oral habits. That is thumb sucking, finger sucking, um, nail biting, tongue sucking, tongue chewing. I, I mean, you, you name it, I've seen it. Um, it's teaching people how to breathe nasally. I, I want you to think about when babies are born, we are nasal breathers and um, something causes us to breathe out of our mouth. We talked a lot about that. So our program actually teaches them to go back to that lips closed, breathing through their nose, especially after we get the ENT's um, approval that they are airway patency and we can do that. Myofunctional therapy includes correcting your oral, facial, and lingual rest posture so that I'm sitting here staring at Julie and she has perfect lips closed, breathing through her nose with her tongue resting on the roof of her mouth. Myofunctional therapy also includes how to chew and swallow properly and how to habituate those good habits. And then correcting speech sound errors and finally working with an interdisciplinary team. I love working with the team of professionals that I do. What do all these pictures have in common? Um, we've talked about a lot of them today. Upper left-hand corner is thumb sucking. Middle is a tongue thrust. To the right, you see that low tone, mouth breathing, lip incompetence, forward resting posture. I'm also gonna guess that that kid has a diastema or, a, um, or I know that the kid has a diastema but has a labial tie um, and that, that frenum is tight. To the left is a short lingual frenulum. Uh, Shih Tzu always has a tongue thrust. And the one on the lower right-hand side, you guys might have a harder time identifying what that is, but that is lingual scalloping, and it comes from the tongue resting in the wrong spot in the mouth. Um, Julie, should I go through these case studies? I'm thinking that I'm running a little bit short on time, so I want you guys to kind of 
just explain them? But okay. Too. This first case study is a 10 year old girl who sucked her thumb. I'm talking all the time. She had had three habit cribs. Nothing was successful until she did the thumbs up program. The girl was done in a day. They were so grateful. Um, she just rocked it and she was a pleasure to work with. And this is the case with all of my thumb and finger suckers. They just do well. The, again, you know, your caseload can be from infancy up to adulthood. This was a 38 year old female. She had gone and gotten an orthodontic splint and it caused an open bite. She got her braces on, she got some myofunctional therapy, and 10 sessions later, she was perfection. Her, her bite looked perfect. Here's Alina. Great picture, so you can see her heart-shaped tongue. You can see that short frenulum that nobody picked up on for nine years. Um, I do a measurement, a tongue-tie ratio. She was 59%, and they say anything under 50% is ankyloglossia. So again, her number didn't fit that measurement that 50 percent but she had all these other hallmark signs so open bite chewing and swallowing issues allergies mouth breathing tongue thrust swallow and speech sound errors she had a lingual phrenectomy and then 10 sessions of our program and she was good to go so personally in simon says i've created these myofunctional therapy programs i basically got my initial training was in a room of dental hygienists and dentists and orthodontists and a couple speech therapists and my I, within a half an hour i was like oh my god oh my god oh my god this is meant for me this is based on my knowledge base this is the perfect thing for this is my new niche market i love this i've never heard of this we never did this in grad school why did nobody teach this to me and i left my program and um you know there were only a couple of speech therapists in the room with me we tried to keep in touch right after the course was over and one immediately didn't start practicing it and the other one did for like maybe a month but then she was like i don't know i don't feel like this program really speaks to me as a speech therapist i don't know if i can do this but i was like i think i'm gonna change it to make it appropriate for speech pathologists and since hence thumbs up and tongue tips were born um thumbs up is the thumb sucking elimination program and tongue tips it says tongue thrust remediation program i've really revamped that now julie we need to revamp that because it's really an orofacial myofunctional um therapy program it's more than working back in the day they like i told you they would call um a myofunctional disorder a tongue thrust it is not it's just a symptom of it so this is really tongue tips and orofacial myofunctional um program as you can see in my pamphlets it, it's reflected correctly all right, so thumbs up. Thumbs up is a 30-day behavioral modification program. It's so empowering. It's one of my favorite things to do within my practice. These kids are done in a day. They're just, they're just done in a day. Of course, we continue for 30 days. It's like 30 days to kick the habit, but they end up feeling so amazing about themselves. They get rewards, they get prizes, but the best reward of all is that they feel successful. I just had a kid come in yesterday for his one week check-in and um, I said, so how you doing? He's like, I crushed it. I mean, literally he's the coolest kid ever. And he's like, I crushed it. And then he sent me a text this morning because we now have eliminated one piece of it, which is to use socks. And he just used his lotion and he's like, I forgot what he wrote me. He just wrote me. He said, hooray, just magic cream and it worked done. <laughs> so we have his party in two weeks. Um, so that's the thumbs up program. Should I, I, mean, I have so many tools that I use to share. I mean, these are my marketing tools that I show people and it shows them up. Oh, can you guys see this? A before and an after. Mm -hmm. I'll go a little closer. How's that? Sure. This is literally three weeks difference. And I have even more pictures that are even more glaring. Um, I have a question from Patricia. Sure. And she said, can we show that these programs are evidence-based instruction if we use them in the schools? So they're evidence-based for the hundreds upon hundreds upon hundreds of people that use them and have been successful. I think the hard part with the thumbs up program that you're going to have is um, I don't know. I have to think about how to utilize we them in the schools. We do have an inner circle member beginning to do a study. On we that. do. Oh, yes, we do. So one of our inner circle members is a professor at a university, and she's starting to do some evidence-based research, so we will have those concrete 
answers for you. In the past, I've been doing this for nine years and it just works with everybody. But like I said, I'm not a school-based practitioner, but lots of the inner circle members are. Um, many of them who have done thumbs up have done it on the side for a fee. They've made a relationship with the parents and, and provided that therapy to them. Um, but tongue tips, certainly you can, because you can write quantifiable goals which takes me to tongue tips. Tongue tips is 12 sessions. Um, it's therapeutic on average. So like if somebody has speech sound errors, it usually takes longer than that. It's therapeutic exercises for the face, for the lips, for the tongue. We teach them a new swallow. We teach them, I have to change this proper breathing. We do speech therapy. Um, anybody who tells you that you can do a tongue thrust or myofunctional program and not directly address the speech sound errors is wrong and they're not a speech therapist. So, um, we we have to address those those issues and then so exciting we are in the process um, of rolling out next year our tiny tongue tips program because what we found is that we've been using tongue tips for so very long but we used to start it kind of like at like seven or eight and up and we realized that we're missing this little group of like three to six year olds that need some early intervention so because we know that form follows function because we know that the face is growing and constantly changing we created a play-based program that teaches younger children proper postures and we do like warm-ups and we have mouth time and we have breathing time and sop and snack time. We have sip and snack time and we have talking time. And um, these can be implemented in a group setting or it can be done individually. Um, and I kind of feel like it's for those that are identified with a myofunctional disorder or those that are at risk for it. Who is a part of your interdisciplinary team? Well, I love, I think because of all my years working in the hospitals, I just got used to it. I mean, anybody who's worked with, even if you're in the schools, you're working with an interdisciplinary team, right? You have your principal, you have your teacher, you have your reading specialist, you have your writing specialist, your learning um, specialist, and your speech therapist, and your OT, and, and that's your school interdisciplinary team. In a hospital, I would work with a neurosurgeon and the rehabilitation doctor and the OTs and the PTs and the social worker and the family, and that was my interdisciplinary team. Um, now, in myofunctional therapy, my interdisciplinary team is um, the orthodontist, the dentist, my dental hygienist, the ENT, the oral surgeon, and the pediatricians, and if I need them, the PT or osteopath to work on, um, we do a lot with posture to prevent that forward um, posture of the body. So that's my interdisciplinary team. When I go in to do my lunch and learn, and I go in and I do this for pediatricians, dentists, and orthodontists, I pose questions, it's kind of how I start. And I say, has thumb or finger sucking been a problem for your patients? And I kind of, have you been using cribs or rakes? They should never be using cribs or rakes. They are terrible appliances and you can do the same thing with your thumb sucking program making them feel terrific. So these are questions, you can look through them at another time. I don't need to go through them um, to belabor them, but look through them um, and, and see if, if you have any questions about them. Like I said at the beginning of this, the big, one of the biggest takeaways I wanted you to come away with is to be able to identify what a myofunctional disorder or looks like. So different things that you might see within your patients. I want you to look at your patients differently. I want you to think about their oral habits. Seeing a fourth grader who's been sucking their thumb all day and night, but you're sitting there trying to work on a neutral R is like beating your head against a wall. So you have to address the elephant in the room. Um, tongue thrust, reverse swallow, immature swallow, abnormal chewing and eating behaviors. These are signs and symptoms that you see. Somebody doesn't just want to eat mac and cheese because they want to eat mac and cheese and that's all they like. They eat mac and cheese and mac and cheese only because they don't have the muscular support to to support chewing something more substantial like chicken or a raw carrot or a cucumber. Um, structural abnormalities, we've got to look in their mouth. We've got to look in their mouth to look for enlarged tonsils or pot, possibly inflamed adenoids, for, for clefts, for labial frenulum, for open bites. We have to look at their tongue. If you see lingual scalloping, where is their tongue resting? In between their teeth. We have to look at whether there's some TMJ and muscular issues. It's because they're not holding their facial muscles properly. And we have to look at the speech sound errors. And if you've been treating them for 100 years, you might be missing the underlying issue altogether. So I pose you this question. I've literally been talking a mile a minute. 
I told you it's my passion. I could talk about this all day, every day. I do talk about it every day, all day. My husband's probably tired of hearing about it. Um, Julie now knows more. <laughs> she could be a speech pathologist at this point. Um, but my question to you guys is, after hearing me talk for the past hour, do you want to learn more? Have you thought about more training? Have you thought about learning about myofunctional disorders and therapy so that you can really make an impact and a difference in your clients' lives? Well, if you do, and the answer to those questions is yes, then think about joining me at one of my seminars. I, I told you at the beginning, I told you the story from yesterday that I got to kind of reflect and be grateful that my professional growth in the past nine years has been tremendous and that I'm so grateful that not only do I get to make an impact in my patients' lives, but I'm so grateful I get to travel around the country teaching speech therapists, who doesn't like to be in a room of speech therapists, um, training them on how to provide myofunctional therapy. It doesn't get better than that, right? And I think our um, grad programs are kind of doing a disservice to us because they're not teaching us about myofunctional therapy and it is the new up and coming niche and everybody's going to need it and everybody is going to need to learn about it because you're missing it if you're not training your patients with it. Am I getting short on time? No, what's crazy too is there's 300 people that signed up today. Oh my God. Okay, so just so you know, guys, there's um, 300 people that are on this webinar today. So this is like, they don't tell me these things when I go on the camera because they know that like freaks me out. Um, wow, so hi, 300 people. I'm glad you're here. Um, but what I also want to share with you is that I do these seminars. I, I've just done them for the past year. We've had tremendous success. The last, I think, Three of them have sold out completely. So when we went to New York, when we went to Dallas, when we went to LA, they were all sold out. Our room was full, which means that you guys as speech pathologists, you are realizing how important this information is to treating your patients and treating them holistically. In 2019, we have some upcoming seminars. Um, again, just based on this PowerPoint page, you can see that it's a three-day training. So the first two days, I think it's on the next page, right? Yeah, here's the daily breakdown. On the first day, you're going to learn about myofunctional therapy and how to identify and assess OMDs. So, you know, when Victoria and Patricia were asking about how to assess that tongue tie, I will teach you how to identify and evaluate your patients from a myofunctional standpoint. In day two, I'm going to show you all three of my programs. Well, two of them, and then in 2019, we're doing tiny tongue tips. We're rolling it out. But you will get, um, you get, well, you'll see what you'll get, but you get these binders that have the program all mapped out for you for tongue tips and for thumbs up. And in the third day, and this is what I think really differentiates, Simon says, and I think it's just such an essential part. Um, you know what, my battery is going to die here in a second. I got your charger. Just Okay, um, is that you're going to learn how to implement myofunctional therapy immediately. You're going to leave my seminar. You're going to get business development. You are going to get training in how to create your own business. I, I don't really have one here. Okay, so we're going to just keep going um, into your current caseload or, or your practice. So that's what those three days are going to be. Here's what you're going to get, guys. You're going to get, I call it my cookbook. It's like a binder. You'll see it on the next page. It's the one off to the right with Alina's picture on it. You're going to get a binder that has our three-day PowerPoint on it. You're going to get your thumbs up program. In it is a script as well as your comic book. We now have three comic books written and we have our Oral Avenger crew. Um, you're going to get a myofunctional therapy Deluxe kit. Oh, actually, I have one right in my bag. I can hold it up. This, okay. the, yeah. Perfect. So you're going to get a kit. We have a, um, a couple companies that we work with and um, one company that, that helps us build one just for Simon Says. You're going to get exercise flashcards. You're going to get explanations and a guide on how to use them. You get a placemat that your kid, you can laminate and your kids can use it when they eat so that they have proper posture when they're eating. You're going to get the marketing brochures with your picture potentially on the back if you want. Um, you're gonna get a cup, a pen, a bag. Here's my bag. Um, lots, of, lots of goodies. This is kind of a picture representation of all the things that you're gonna get. When do you get to go to a seminar? I've been to a lot of seminars, never do I get so much swag. So <laughs> there's a lot of stuff that you get. The biggest gift that you get when you come to the seminar is that you get to leave the program feeling like you can implement myofunctional therapy um, immediately afterwards. Um, oh, great. Perfect, so that we got to the end there. So 
please let me know if you have questions. Um, in 2018, we are kind of filling up now, so I want to tell you about that. In October, we're going to be in Tyson's Corner, Virginia, and Julie, two spots, what do we have left in that? Two spots. There's two spots left in that class. Um, in January, we're going to be in LA again. We just were there in July and sold out, but how many spots do we have left in, in January? Three. Three spots Three. left in January um, in LA. We're coming back to DC in March and going to Chicago in July, Boston in August, and San Francisco in October. Um, in 2019, we're going to start rolling out that tiny tongue tips program as well. Um, so we're, you know, we're constantly changing, improving, and implementing um, new um, ideas and, um, and and activities and, um, you know, kind of uh, information and, and therapy so that you can implement that with, with your patients. So um, I hope that you will join me at a seminar. I hope that if you have questions, you can post them to us. Julie is going to... What are we going to do? You don't you so I'm sending an email immediately after. Okay, so you guys are going to get an email right after today's webinar. And I believe there's going to be a link for registration yes. if you guys want to join us for a seminar. But like I said, if you have questions, if you've watched back this webinar, or you've been watching and you have questions in your mind, just feel free to shoot us some questions. I'm happy to answer anything that you have with regard to myofunctional disorders and myofunctional therapy. I hope that you enjoyed the webinar. I hope that I've kind of sparked a little interest and a little passion in you guys with regard to this field and this niche market. We are going to be at ASHA, so if anybody's going to Boston, come see us in ASHA. We have like prime real estate right near Super Duper, um, so I hope you'll come visit us and, uh, and ask any questions you might have about Simon Says. So have a fantastic day. Thanks for listening, and um, I hope you have a good one, and hope to see you soon. Take care. I'm going to do that. Got it. Okay.